Published in 2001, the Human Genome Project worked out the complete sequence of 3 billion DNA letters necessary to code for an individual human being. This monumental feat stands as one of the greatest ever achievements in science. As well as knowing the total sequence of human DNA, scientists now know the complete genetic code from more than a thousand other species. Comparing the genomes of different organisms can help researchers to decide upon the most important experiments to conduct. It may also allow them to shift some of their experiments from working with animal models, such as mice and fish, onto studies using simpler and less controversial species instead. Comparative genomics allows us to compare genes that are conserved, right from very simple organisms through to uh, through to higher organisms like man, and as well as showing us the similarities, it shows us the differences. So it shows us where systems have evolved to develop more complexity, so we can begin to understand how genes have specialised uh, through comparison between different organisms. Genes are said to be conserved if their sequences are the same or very similar in different organisms. This can often be an indication that they code for an important protein. If, however, the DNA sequences in various species are very different, that can also be highly informative. Many scientific projects today start by using computers to compare the genome sequences of different organisms. One medically relevant study led by Susan Dutcher of Washington University began with the unlikely sounding comparison of human DNA with the genomes of two plant species, Chlamydomonas and Arabidopsis as a way of focusing on genes involved in the production of hair-like structures called cilia. This work is important because a range of rare but devastating diseases are caused by mutations in proteins within cilia and an associated structure called a basal body, which serves as an anchor for cilia within the cell. These diseases have diverse symptoms ranging from kidney disease to progressive blindness. So because basal bodies play such a key role in organising cilia and flagella, then any defect in a basal body that actually prevents formation of the cilia or functioning of the cilia will lead to various different defects in human development. Dutch's team were very clever when they chose to use Chlamydomonas and Arabidopsis for comparison with the human genome. The first plant, Chlamydomonas, is a single-celled organism that lives in water. It possesses two flagella which it beats in order to move around. Flagella are simply elongated cilia grown from basal bodies. The second plant, Arabidopsis, lives on land. In keeping with most land-based plants, Arabidopsis has no need for cilia or flagella, and therefore it can be assumed it will not have the genes needed to make basal bodies. So if you say, well, what's common to organisms like Chlamydomonas and humans, but absent in the land plant, then you're immediately getting at genes which you have a initial suspicion might be involved in forming cilia and flagella. And this is the, the principle on which uh, the scientific group led by Susan Dutcher went about looking for genes which are uh, specifically required for basal body uh, function. To begin by screening the entire human genome to try and find a gene coding for a basal body protein would be the equivalent of looking for a needle in a very large haystack. By limiting the search only to genes found in both humans and Chlamydomonas, both of which have basal bodies, we can make the haystack much smaller. Then, by excluding genes which are also found in Arabidopsis, which we know does not have basal bodies, the search can be even more focused. By using comparative genomics in this way, Dutch's team were able to go from an initial list of several thousand genes and reduce it to between 600 and 700 candidate genes. Now the question is, if you have these um, candidates for uh, the genes that are absent in Arabidopsis, candidates for being involved in forming cilia and flagella, well, what's the next step? How do you find out that they are involved in that? So the Dutcher group really had to come up with experimental techniques that allowed them to test potential functions in cilia activity and one could carry out those experiments in humans, but having shown that those genes are conserved in Chlamydomonas, it was much simpler to use the model organism to do those experiments. So for example, using experimental techniques, you can remove flagella from Chlamydomonas, and those organisms will simply grow the flagella back again. 
And when they do that, they will upregulate those genes that are required for flagella synthesis. And so we can look at which of those 600 genes are upregulated when you ask the flagella to regrow. The next thing that you would do would be to start to knock those genes out in one way and another and find what the effect is. That's perhaps most e easily done in Chlamydomonas. You would knock them out and then you would ask, well, what is the effect then on uh, the formation of the flagellum or the function of the flagellum? So through this very elegant approach of comparative genomics, a new gene was identified that's involved in human disease and that had not been identified in any other approach. As this simple example demonstrates, possession of the complete genome sequence of many organisms, and especially of humans, is providing scientists with a hugely valuable research tool. By starting their research with analysis of DNA databases, scientists can save time and save money by reducing the number of unnecessary experiments they might otherwise have carried out. Importantly, this approach can lead to a reduction in the number of experiments using mammals and other vertebrate species by helping to identify lower organisms in which meaningful research can be conducted.